I heard comments as you came in the door. You looked at the sermon title and thought, what in the world? What's he going to do? Okay, well, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do, okay? Our world is fairly pet crazy. I'm sure you've noticed that, haven't you? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, there were pet supplies on one aisle of the grocery store. Now we have entire stores devoted to those pet supplies. And more than just being devoted to them, they encourage you to bring the, your pets with you when you go to the store. Now, a couple days ago, I was in Walmart and I uh, saw something I needed was behind a basket and, of somebody else, and so they were off doing something else. So I just gently pushed it and I heard a growl. <laughs> and there was a dog in the basket at Walmart. And then I saw the same thing at Lowe's. And I'm thinking, what is up with these people? I mean, what does a dog need in, the, in Lowe's? I mean, you know. Anyway, I'd, uh, you know, let your mind wander on that for a little bit. Anyway, uh, dogs and cats, of course, had the list of pets. But from there, we'll branch out to things like pet canaries, gerbils, hamsters, snakes, monkeys. You go to Australia, people have pet kangaroos, uh, turtles, ducks, cows, fish, iguanas, ants, pigs. There are some people who even have pet skunks, defumigated, of course. And some of you are probably thinking, well, you left out my brother-in-law's pet whatever. Okay, I understand that. One thing's for sure, though, and that is that nobody wants a pet buzzard. No one. People don't buy them. They don't want them in the house. They don't have pictures of buzzards on their wall. Well, unless you're Jerry Jones, the illustrious, wonderful owner of the Dallas Cowboys. He has a picture of a buzzard, it's been told, on his wall. And the caption says, forget patience, let's go kill something. <laughs> Boy, that endears him to me, let me tell you. Okay. Uh, but even in... I mean, you know, we, we don't want stuffed buzzards. You know, you know stuffed animals... Uh, my daughters have tons of stuffed animals and there's not a buzzard to be found among them. Even in, in cartoons, they try to make them look a little more colorful and attractive, you know, but they always talk with the yup, yup, dope, 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 you know, they have that dopey talk. Uh, buzzards are simply and emphatically obnoxious. You know, all that reminds me about a preacher who was doing a gospel meeting or a revival type of thing in a distant town. And uh, after services, uh, he was standing at the back and a, a young boy about five years old came by and he, he recognized him as because uh, one of the people had pointed out the family that he was going to go have supper with that night. And so he you know, was going to make conversation with the little five-year-old and said, well, I, I think I'm go coming to your house for supper tonight. And the little boy said, uh, I know it, you are. And he said, well, what do you suppose we're going to have? The little fellow didn't even hesitate. He said, we're having buzzard. <laughs> and the preacher came back with, buzzard? Are you sure? Yep, said the boy. I heard daddy talking about it yesterday. He said, well, if we got to have that old buzzard, we'll have him for dinner tomorrow night. <laughs> Needless to say, the preacher wasn't exactly flattered. <laughs> People are a lot like animals. I'm sure you've noticed. Uh, one lady once said, uh, why do I need a husband? I've got a parrot that cusses, a dog that sleeps all day, and a cat that stays out all night. Yeah, I I've known some men who fit that bill, and I've known some women as well that, that fit that description. And of course, all of us at one time or another have heard people compared to animals. You know, he's just the big old teddy bear. Uh, he roars like a lion. He's as mean as a snake. He's as stubborn as a mule. And he's as blind as a bat. Okay, good, good. Y'all got the, the feeling here. Eats like a horse. Grouchy as a bear. Sly as a... Strong as an... Hey, those rhyme, don't they? Isn't that cool? Uh, we've all 
compared people to animals, haven't we? But what is it about buzzards that no one wants them for a pet? Well, they have a lot of really bad habits. And beware, because if you possess these traits, you'll be about as welcome around people as a skunk at a wedding. Or as uh, one of my favorite professors from my college days, the late Avon Malone was fond of saying, you'll be about as welcome as a pork chop in a synagogue. <laughs> Mostly, it boils down to attitude. The buzzard attitude. What, what contributes to the buzzard attitude? Well, first of all, buzzards look obnoxious. I mean, from the first glance, uh, they're, they're obnoxious looking. Their posture lends itself to a lurking appearance. You get up close to them and they're dull and dirty and, and the smell is something the other side of awful. They circle in the air. And when they're circling, they're looking for one thing. They're looking for something that is dead or dying. Something putrid and smelly. It's all that they live for. They can spot a stink a mile away and they hasten to the spot. If anything is sweet and alive and vibrant, you won't see a buzzard for miles around. Some people, unfortunately, are a lot like this. They want the dirt. They want the scandal. They want the gossip. They are the happiest when they know the deep, dark, dirty facts on other people. And they delight in telling them to whoever will listen. And if those facts, uh, those, uh, those things that they tell them don't impress them enough, they'll make some more stuff up on their own. Like vacuum cleaners, they suck in all the dirt. And they, find, they can find and delight in dumping it in every conversation that they have, no matter who it hurts, so long as it doesn't hurt them. They'll flat out kill another person. Not literally, but they will assassinate a person's character. Verbally. All for just the joy of watching the person squirm while they die. If you like this, good people will avoid you. Much like they avoid buzzards. They won't want to be around you. Buzzards look obnoxious. Another thing about buzzards and the buzzard attitude. Buzzards don't sing. Ever hear a singing buzzard? I never have. Uh, if you want a singer, you look for a canary or a parakeet or, or one of the many wild birds. And you delight to have those singers around. They bring joy and happiness to everyone. Even if you are having the absolute worst possible day, when they talk to you, well, things don't look nearly so bad. There are both kinds of people, you know. Some people never sing. They never encourage. They, uh, uh, nothing positive ever comes out of their mouths. In fact, for some of these peoples, if they ever dared to even crack a smile, their face would explode, you think. You know? uh, only negative, critical, complaining comments come from them. And then there are people who bring their own sunshine wherever they go. It's not a question of if they're going to be happy, it's how happy they're going to be and how much cheer they're going, to spread, they're going to spread. People always feel better when they're around. They are cheerful, positive, excited, and exciting. They are natural encouragers. They listen. They take notice. And they praise. Friends look for People like them. Friends flock to them. People run to this kind of person. People run from the first kind because no one wants a pet buzzard. Another bad quality of buzzards is, the, is their filthy appetite. They will find, quote unquote, food under rocks and in dark, out of the way places. If we're putting if we're personifying them, there are people who maybe they cast a furtive glance around themselves before they go into a quote-unquote adult 
bookstore or a quote unquote adult Bible uh, uh, beverage store or whatever. You know, they know they're not maybe supposed to be there and they want to make sure nobody that they know sees them and everything. They feed on that kind of stuff, which seasons their conversations with filthy, suggestive talk. They're anxious to hear or more often tell the latest dirty joke. The more vulgar, the better for them. People hate buzzards for this reason. And a little bit of this type of person goes a long way. You will not see a crowd of friends around people like this. They may be a novelty, you know, tolerated by a few for a short period of time. But long-range friendships and social success doesn't come to buzzards. We simply try to stay away from people with buzzard breath. There are, there are more traits that go along with this buzzard attitude. Intimidation is one of those traits. Uh, some believe in winning through intimidation. If they have something on you, they'll blackmail you for all that you're worth. And I'm not talking about for money. We're talking about with your character and uh, self-respect. But those who seem to win in this manner find it short success. In the long run, salesmen who... Uh, follow the intimidation route will lose. Have you ever been approached by a salesman who tried to intimidate you? It's not fun. It really isn't. I can remember we uh, were going to buy a car in Oklahoma City one time and uh, when we were living in Oklahoma. And uh, we went to this dealership and uh, I mean, it was hard sale uh, intimidation from the get-go. It so happens that we uh, were going to spend the night in Oklahoma City and uh, go to a surgery for one of the younger kids that uh, was in the congregation in Leedy that I was preaching at. And uh, I think that they thought that, uh, that I had said that it was one of our kids that was having the surgery because you know, one of their things, they were putting their hard press on us and then they let up for a moment and they said, oh, we'll pay for your hotel for tonight since you have that surgery in the, in, in the morning and everything. And you know, I, I didn't bother correcting them because they were already getting enough of my money and they had taken our money for the hotel too. So uh, anyway, but the, you know, salespeople who follow that type of intimidation route, they, they, it's not fun to be around them. True salespeople help their customers get what the customer wants and what the customer needs. And such customers are glad that even five and six years after the sale, they go back to buy from the same salesperson again and again. And if they go back to the dealership and they find out that that, that person isn't there anymore, they'll seek them out. Because they took care of them and didn't go the intimidation route. You know, buzzards have no such customer loyalty. Once you escape the clutches of a buzzard, you rarely ever go back. Unless, of course, you enjoy being bullied and blackmailed and pushed around. The best way to fight intimidators is to stand up to them. And if you do, they won't try it again. Then, there are the loud, obnoxious folks. The folks that we might say have an eye problem. Not eye as in needing glasses, but I as in, I did this, and I did that. Tooting their own horn, no matter how old that horn happens to be. Some people like to do all the talking. They've always got to outdo you. If you caught a fish this big, they caught a fish this big. You know the type of person I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, it's, if you've landed a sail, they've landed a bigger sail. Uh, it's no fun to be around people like that. Well, I take that back. It can be fun. When I was growing up in our youth group, we had a uh, guy that uh, was, no was noted for doing this. You know, you told him you did one thing, he said, well, I did this, and, you know, and, and it was bigger and grander than your whatever you did and everything. And you, know, you knew he was lying. And so sometimes some of us would get together and, and we'd uh, see if we could, just how big of a yarn we could get him to spin. And it was quite funny to hear some of the things that he would come up with when we'd come up with some pretty tall tales ourselves and he'd have to out-tall the tail and everything. And You know, it could be, but you don't like to be around people like that very much and for very long. 
They can never be content just to listen and congratulate. They must play one-upmanship constantly. And they do so at the loss of good friends. Several years back, uh, when we lived in Delight, Arkansas, and I was refereeing soccer, I uh, refereed a game with a guy who was quite proud of himself because he was telling us about the 20,000 games that he had officiated when he lived in California. And I'm thinking, you know, buddy, if you've refereed 20,000 soccer games and you're still just doing high school soccer, you must not be very good. I mean, seriously, 20,000 games and he's not at an international level? I mean, that, that, that's way up there. That's World Cup, FIFA type of things and everything. Well, there, not, only, <coughs> excuse me, not only is there the eye trouble, but there's also the know-it-alls, the gossipers, sometimes known, known as people with hoof and mouth disease. They learn something about someone else and so they hoof it to their neighbors and they mouth off, right? Uh, and by the way, never ever try to correct these people because they're right, despite, despite the fact that the facts prove them otherwise. It almost sounds like I'm describing politicians, don't you think? I mean, seriously. And then there's, there's the negative thinkers, the broadcasters of gloom and doom, full of whining and self-pity. Following this in these negative thinkers' footsteps are the, the critical, the grouchy, the complainers, the people who love to garbage dump on anyone that they meet, everyone that they meet. They smother you with all of their troubles. Cavett Robert once said, don't tell other people your problems. 80% don't care, and the other 20% are glad it happened to you. Don't miss the point here. We need to be able to lean on our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we're having a bad day, we need to be able to call someone up from church and say, hey, I'm having a really bad day. <coughs> Excuse me. And I just need to talk to someone. And we need to be able to share with them. Just not the same person all the time, every time that you see them. And add to this the talkers. <laughs> People who couldn't keep a secret to save their life. You know the type. You tell them something deeply personal that you want to keep between you and them. And the next thing you know, you see it on Facebook. You know, th th those type of people. We, we don't like those type of people. And, uh, and then there is the takers. Who take all your time and never seem to give it back or to return it. So buzzards look obnoxious. They don't sing. They have a filthy appetite. Uh, they practice intimidation. They have eye trouble. They, they are the know-it-alls, the negative thinkers, the talkers, and the takers. That, thankfully, about rounds out the buzzard attitude. So what we want to know, though, is how do we avoid the buzzard attitude? Well, what does it take to have friends? Lots of friends. Good friends. Friends that are there in good times as well as in bad times. Friends for a healthy, lifelong relationship. Well, if we look at a buzzard as an animal that we wouldn't want to have for a pet, let's, let's see if we can figure out some things from animals that people do look for for pets. We like dogs because of their loyalty, don't we? I mean, their faithfulness. Someone once said that what they appreciated most about their dog is that he wagged his tail and not his tongue. Dogs are always glad to see you. You can put a dog in a crate for a day. And when you come home and let them out, they are just so happy that you're there. And they'll run around and they'll jump up on you. And, and it's just wonderful. Some people like cats because they're cuddly and they desire affection from people. We like uh, canaries because they are bright and cheery and they sing beautifully. Things like soft and cuddly and friendly are the reasons most people pick the pets that they have. Most people like the same things in people as well. If I were to ask you what you liked in your friends, you might say things like sincerity, confidentiality, 
a positive attitude, cheerful, loyal. I can relax around them. They let me be me, accepting, givers, uh, love me no matter what. Can, I, can we agree that a person with most of these qualities would be a pretty good friend? I think so. Do you know that that is exactly the type of person the Bible instructs us to be? Yet there are so many people who fight the Bible. They fight God and they fight church. Somehow believing that it isn't the quote-unquote normal way to live. They think that if you believe in God or the Bible, that that means you can't have any fun. Because the Bible just has a bunch of rules. And rules that have, have extreme consequences. And God is just that bully up in the sky who's got his magnifying glass and we're the ants. And if, if he sees us doing something wrong, he's going to zap us with that magnifying glass in the sun and everything. In truth, all God wants is for you to be happy, healthy, prosperous, and have lots of friends. In short, what the world is looking for in friends are people who live like the Bible tells us to live. Now you might be thinking, now Carl, this is supposed to be a sermon, and that's the first mention of the Bible that it, well, you haven't said any scriptures yet or nothing. Well, that was just the introduction. I stubbed my three points in a poem. I'm just kidding. But let's, let's do take a look at some examples of friendship from the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, if you want to open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 20, we find one of the most beautiful stories of friendship. Jonathan and David. They had to have been two of the best friends the world has ever seen. And they were unlikely friends. Jonathan was the heir apparent to the throne of his father, King Saul of Israel. David, well, David, it was obvious, was Jonathan's chief rival for that throne. And not only that, it was obvious that David was going to assume the throne following King Saul. Yet instead of trying to get rid of David so that he could inherit the throne of his father, Jonathan said, well, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. Verses 12 through 17. Then Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed toward you, I will, not, will I not send word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as He has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live so that I may not be killed. And do not, even, do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. That's a beautiful passage with some beautiful comments about friendship. Jonathan knew David was going to be king. And he says, hey David, just show me and my descendants unfailing kindness. But perhaps the most telling Scripture about David and Jonathan's friendship is a little bit later in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 42. And this is possibly the last time that David and Jonathan ever spoke. And in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 42, we read these words, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. Do you think David 
ever treated Jonathan like a buzzard? I don't think so. In fact, later on we read about Jonathan's son Mephibosheth, who was lame in both feet. And when David finds out about him, David says, he's going to come, he's going to eat at my table. And his advisor says, oh, no, 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 no. Because Mephibosheth, he could make claim to the throne. He could, be a, he could lead a rebellion against you. And David said, no, 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 no. He's a descendant of my friend Jonathan, and I want him to eat at my table. Do you think Jonathan ever treated David like a buzzard? Well, apparently not. I mean, even when he had a chance to. I mean, in 1 Samuel 20, verse 12 through 17, where he's talking, they're talking, you know, if King Saul was inclined to hurt David, Jonathan could have very easily sent word to David, hey, you know, <laughs> my father's okay. Just come on back to the town. And David would have been killed. But not only does Jonathan not do that, he swears with the most binding oath possible. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I don't send you away, if my father's going to hurt you. David and Jonathan chose to be a friend instead of a buzzard. And then there's also the story of Ruth and Naomi. Ruth's statement to Naomi in Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, is such a wonderful statement of friendship. Naomi is trying to get Ruth to return to her father's house. Orpha, her other daughter-in-law, has already left. Went back to her parents' home to find another Moabite husband and everything. And as Ruth is being encouraged by Naomi to do the same thing, Ruth makes one of the greatest statements of friendship on record in or outside of the Scriptures in Ruth 1, 16 and 17, where Ruth says, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. What an incredible statement of friendship. So incredible that in fact when I'm performing a wedding and they, the bride and the groom are going to repeat the vows, we go through the standard richer for poorer, better for worse, so on and so forth. And then they repeat after me, the words, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. How good must Naomi have felt to know that Ruth was willing to give up everything she'd ever known for her? How much better must Naomi have felt when Ruth actually did give up everything she had known for her? What an incredible friendship Ruth and Naomi shared. Don't you want a friend like that? Yeah, you look at Ruth chapter 1 and how uh, and Ruth and her actions in Ruth chapter 1, but then you keep reading in the next three chapters of Ruth or the last three chapters of Ruth. And you notice how Naomi treats Ruth in those three chapters. It's with that same sense of loyalty and respect. Could you stand to have a friend like Ruth and a friend like Naomi? If you were not you, would you want you for a friend? That's a tongue twister and a mind bender if you think about it. If you were not you, would you want you for a friend? Simply put, would you like to have somebody like you for a friend? If not, don't be surprised if you have few friends. Concentrate on developing in yourself those qualities that you look for in a friend and want in a friend. 
Read through the book of 1 Samuel. Look at David and Jonathan's relationship. Read through the book of Ruth and look at Ruth and Naomi's relationships. See it, what they had that you are missing and try to, get, try to get it. It's a pretty sure thing that in no time at all you'll have all the friends that you need. In fact, you know the best, best method of evangelizing is through what's called friendship evangelism. Telling your friends about Jesus. If you don't have any friends, it's hard to practice friendship evangelism because enemy evangelism very rarely ever works. If we want to be the people that God wants us to be, if we want to fulfill our part of the Great Commission, we have to be the type of people that people like to be around. Now, I'm not saying we compromise our principles and bend and mold our, our principles to, to what the world wants us to be. I'm not suggesting that we take a survey and say, okay, what do you want in a church? And then become that even if the Bible speaks out against it. I'm saying we have to be friends with people. We, would, we have to get involved with people who are on the outside, so to speak. You know, Jesus didn't just get involved with His disciples. Nor did He only meet the needs of His disciples. Jesus knew that He had come into the world to seek and to save what was lost, Luke 19 verse 10 tells us. Guess what I'm trying to tell you is no one, not even Jesus, wants a pet buzzard. So don't be a buzzard. Don't be a buzzard. Be a friend to people. Be, smile more. Be more outgoing. Be more outreaching to others. Be a friend. And you'll have friends. And you can reach out to them. And you'll hear Jesus say on that great day, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your Master's happiness. This evening, if things aren't right between you and God, they need to be made right. Making them right might require a private response. Making them right may, might require a public response. Whatever that need is, make the appropriate response. And if it's a public response, won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together?